everyone and welcome to the next episode of On Point Videocast with the Roxy Ballet. So today we have a very special guest, Kaylee Cahoon, uh, the creator of the Smart Core Method. Welcome, Kaylee. I was originally a professional modern dancer. Um, I danced with Alan Nikolai and Mary Lewis and um, toured around the world. And I grew up at the North Carolina School of the Arts. That's where I went to high school. And um, pretty much just through my life have been obsessed with movement. I thought I was obsessed with dance. Turns out I was actually obsessed with movement. And um, that has launched me into this new career of what I do now, which is I re-educate patterning, neuromuscular patterning of people. Um, and I move fascia. I'm also a manual therapist. So I do fascia work and re-education of the nervous system. That's very interesting. Yeah. This is actually the first time that I heard about this method when Liz had the idea okay. to invite as a guest to our yes. video cast. So it is very interesting to learn more about this. <laughs> yeah, and that leads us yeah. into our next question, which is what is the SMART core method and what in yes. um, inspired you to develop it? Okay, so um, throughout my life and in my dancing particularly, a lot of dancers are obsessed with how high their leg can get, how many turns they can do. I was more obsessed with how is my body doing the thing that I'm asking it to do? Like, what am I using? What muscles am I using? How am I using mechanical advantage? Where's the physics of what I'm doing? And um, how much effort is actually necessary to do the thing I'm asking my body to do? And so I was just very obsessed with the how things were happening that I, um, I, I just kind of fell into um, asking myself that question for everything. You know, how is, how is my leg leaving first position, right? Is my heel, when, at what point is my heel going down into the ground? And at what point does my heel start to leave the ground? And am I choosing that because I've made a habit of doing that? Or am I really connecting with the ground and finding that moment when it's most appropriate to let my heel leave the ground? So I am a detail person and I've always been that way. And and because of that, it's launched me into approaching all movement like that. Um, I work with professional athletes a lot right now. And that is the thing that no one asks them is, how are you doing that? You know, everybody's interested in production, but I'm interested in how, how because I think that when you become more efficient in your movement, you can do it a lot longer you'll be able to do it repetitively over and over exactly the same way that you want to. And you also, when you get injured, can come back to finding it again, instead of being lost after injury with compensations and not being able to reconnect with those patterns that you used to know. So my method, I titled it the smart core method. There are lots of people around the world that are doing what I'm doing, but I've basically blended my background of somatic movement understanding how we move and my understanding of pilates and i i'm strong uh, in the feldenkrais method as well and um and i i've blended all of those things and also i was a competitive gymnast when i first um, began as a child so understanding how i use my body in space and i've blended it all together and then i titled it smart core method because having strong muscles doesn't make your body much any smarter. <laughs> so it, it's really about how you use your muscles, right? To get the action to occur and to have precision and specificity. I, I use the word specificity in my work a lot. It's an important aspect because of the detail. And, I, and I'm looking for a body to just have this, uh, make this understanding innate, not because of muscular rep repetition, like, oh, my, my leg knows how to batma, knows how to batma, batma a million times, it knows how to batma, but what, it, what, what can I learn different from that batma every time I batma, you know? And um, that's what I ask in my sessions, and, and now I'm teaching my method. Um, I teach it a manual program and a movement program, and so it's mostly local because I'm in Tennessee, and um, uh, it's, you know, it's slow growing. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so, I find it very interesting because a lot of times, like like you said, like dancers tend to forget the reason why or mm-hmm. how we do it. Like we just repeat yeah. 100 pandas per day. Yeah, yeah autopilot. Yeah, she yeah. said autopilot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's autopilot. And I think that I learned as a young dancer that that's called muscle memory, right? But muscle memory shouldn't be you just get dumb in your head, you know, and you're and you don't have to think anymore. You know, muscle memory should be that you have this um, desire to really master an understanding of, of everything that you're doing at every moment. And also, what does that do? It makes you more present in your body. So then you have the opportunity to also be more artistic because you're really not somewhere else just going through your tondus, but you're actually in there paying attention to what you're doing. So. Yeah. So um, talk a little bit about the nervous system and why you approach it that way. Yeah, so um, muscles are generally fairly dumb, right? Um, Muscles don't say, oh, I think I'm going to go for a run. And then your quads start operating. Like your, your brain tells your body to move forward, right? So muscles have to get the information. And so, um, how they get the information and in what sequence the information comes through and also being told how much effort each muscle needs to put in to make the movement occur. That all comes from the nervous system. So I I approach it that way because you can, um, for example, have um, an, an older person can have weak knees and the PT might say, we have to strengthen your quads, right? But what the PT might not do is teach that person how they are sitting down and how they are getting up. And that might be why they got the weak knees in the first place and why the quads got weak. So just Mm -hmm. by making the quads strong, you didn't fix the pattern that led you to the weakness. And so that's the reason why is because I'm looking for, I'm looking actually to not see my clients anymore. (laughs) <laughs> I want them to be gone and good and, and move on and, and not have to come back all the time to fix their weak quad. You know, I want them to change the way they do things so that they aren't um, having to address the same problem over and over again throughout their lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure that applies mm-hmm. for dance to like, for example, yes. kids or not just kids, like, like professional dancers, even if they stand, let's say like they roll their feet, when they're standing mm-hmm. they and then they it. just mm-hmm. told, like just strengthening the foot but if you're not like yeah correcting how, the way they stand like the way that happens yes yeah. so yeah. that's such a perfect example because if you pronate chances are pretty good there's something going on in your hip mm-hmm. and your pronation is a compensation for something that's not happening in the hip so a teacher might say you know lift your arches cuz I, I had those feet, so I know what you're talking about. Okay. Lift arches. And, so, and so I would lift my arches up and roll to my outer foot a little bit, which made it look like I was correct, right? But then what did I do? I gave myself a horrible tendonitis in my, in my lateral lower leg because I just was solving the problem, but I, I was just solving the problem visually. I wasn't solving the problem in terms of why my feet were choosing to do that in the first place. There was a reason. And so once I was able to address what I wasn't connecting to in my hip, I realized that I don't pronate in my foot, you know? And so it's, um, there's so many reasons why the body chooses to do something. Mm -hmm. And so we as teachers, you know, we often just see the line and we want to fix the line but we don't often ask ourselves, why is that body choosing that? There's a reason. And it's not just because it's wrong. It's because it's the way the body is figured out how to strategize to get something, you know, to achieve something. And it just might not be a real efficient pattern. And, and when we find the efficient pattern, then the whole body can stand appropriately and, and you won't have that problem anymore. Yeah. yeah. Well, all, yeah. All the body parts are connected, so it's very, un, very unlikely yes. I can have the problem in one part. Yes. Like I don't right. say it can't be, but especially legs, because your leg is attached to your hip, and then there's the knee, and then yeah. the ankle. So and you're standing on them. Yes. <laughs> right. All them free. So then you have the whole gravity thing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> exactly. 
actually this leads excellently to our next question which is how does this work lead to a longer career in dance or fitness yeah so how you so when we're born and we're babies our brains are not fully developed our nervous systems are not fully developed and how development occurs in the nervous system comes from movement so babies are born and as they learn new movements as they learn to lift their head as they learn to turn over and roll over, they're actually creating the wiring in the nervous system for how you are going to move for the rest of your life. Now, through repetition, we age, right? And as you get older, and, and I'm in my 50s, so I can tell you this really does happen. You start to go, oh, I like to sit this way in that chair at this hour watching that television show right? And I like to lean on this arm and look at my iPad this way, right? And, and as you get older, you start to find that you have a comfort, almost a need to repeat patterns that are familiar. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is a deterioration of that relationship of your nervous system, your brain, and your muscles, and your patterning. And you're no longer feeding it. And when I was a kid, we thought that our brains, like, you know, once you reached a middle age, you were, your brain cells were dying from that point on until you were dead. And now we know that is not true. We're constantly regenerating new brain cells and new brain patterns. And it, for aging, it's so important to change the way you bought mom once you reach a certain age and mm -hmm. think about it differently because you introduce to your body new information which feeds the system, creates more balance, gives your body more options, gives your body more comp uh, compensation ability as well. And so you'll, you'll do it much, much longer. It's, it's education. You're giving your body more education, which is going to help it make better choices. Better choices are gonna lead to more longevity, better performance, et cetera, yeah. I've got some professional football players that I work with that I've got one in particular and I'm trying to get him to get all the way into his forties because his patterning is so beautiful and he's successful and he can repeat the same thing over and over again. And you know, that would be my goal for my athletes is that they can play the sport that they love so much for as long as they want to and not have their age determine that that mm -hmm. career is over. Mm -hmm. So you when know? you work yeah. with, the, with the athletes, like, do you have mm -hmm. a specific, can you give an example of how do you work with them if you have a football player, for example, and you want to teach them to, you know, learn to do it all over again and always, you know, succeed in the thing? Yeah. You do. Right. So, so um, one of the biggest things for me, especially with football in general, is their feet because they put their feet in cleats and the cleats are very tight. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they go up with shoes that are too small for them. And so they're like ballet dancers, right? So if you were fitted in poorly fitting point shoes when you were young and you got used to that, your toes are all mangled now, right? Because they have been crammed into a, a, inside a shoe that you shouldn't have been wearing. And so it's very similar. And so I want to see them move with their bare feet. I want to see how their toes are participating in bending their knees, how their toes are participating in um, going up onto their toes, how their toes participate in jumping, changing direction. And so I might get, um, give them a whole bunch of movement that is specific to moving the foot in a way that they've never moved the foot before um, to re-educate their foot that it has a million more options than what it's using, you know? And then the toes might not do this inside the cleat. The toes might be more available and ready so that they can change their direction more quickly and not get a high ankle sprain or you know something that's um, indicative to that particular profession because their foot mechanics are bad. So that would be one thing. Then I'm looking at how does that translate up the body, right? Because mm -hmm. if your toes are doing crazy things, your hip, I mean, your knee is tracking funny, your hip is not. So it, it's just, um, it's like investigative work and um and you know i have been known to make a football player plie for sure <laughs> and definitely relevé because um there's so many things dancers know because we um have honed our details and especially in our leg our foot 
you know, and, and uh, athletes, this is kind of new to them. You know, the whole barefoot fitness thing, you know, that's been coming out, people are actually doing fitness with bare feet, you know, and running with bare feet because they realize, oh, I have feet and yeah. they actually can participate, <laughs> right? So I think that that's a really, you know, a big um, benefit of my background coming into sports now is I can give them that information that they never got. They didn't right. even know their toes were supposed to do anything, you know? Right. Yeah, it's yeah. just in the shoe. Right. You don't even <laughs> right. think about it. Yeah, it's just, yeah, the shoe is like one bone, you know? And they yeah. don't realize there's 23. There's 23 right. bones in that shoe. Right. And so, yeah. That's crazy. Um, so and that could lead that could lead that could lead as well to them needing a wider cleat, which they never would have known until they started realizing they needed room in their shoe, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, so how um, do you see this work expanding or becoming more mainstream, or do you see that all in the, yeah. at all in the future? Yes. So. So my, my, my heart and my wish for it becoming more mainstream is in the way that we approach physical therapy mm -hmm. because, oh my gosh, it's, uh, I, I feel that a lot because Western medicine has compartmentalized our bodies to serious degree that you come in with a knee pain and you get a knee treatment and they, they don't have the ability to integrate the knee into the hip and the knee into the ankle and the, you know what I mean? And realize you've been standing on one leg for four years and that might be why you need a hip replacement now. And nobody, you know, I, I feel like I wish that that work and that approach and that integrative style would come into Western medicine because there are so many people who would benefit with their chronic pain. You know, I mean, we're on, we're in opioid world, you know, and it's, there's so many things that we can do to avoid that. So that's, that's where, I, where I would hope it goes into. And I think as we learn more about neuroscience, it is starting to go that way. But it won't be until um, the Western medicine world realizes connected, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and that you can have a, a cardiovascular doctor and you can have a respiratory doctor, but really why, why is that not the same person? right? Or, you know, your thyroid doctor and your skin doctor. I mean, if your thyroids aren't producing the hormones that they need for the healthy skin, uh, why is that not the same person? <laughs> you know what I mean, like, and so this is, this is my wish and hope for, for, you know, our approach. But for now, dancers and athletes benefit from the work because you guys actually seek this type of thing out. And, um, you know, and a lot of times that's what happens. Professional athlete gets onto something and then it becomes, you know, oh, everybody's doing it now. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. That's good for you. Um, so yeah. <laughs> do you train people in your method? Yeah. So we just started a training program and I, at the local massage school here, I had, so I had to split it up into the manual work because you have to have the license to touch, to do some of the work that I do. And, um, and so I, I do that at the local massage school and I'm actually calling that work structural functional body work because it's like structural and also functional. So <laughs> I kind of blended it together. And so I'm, I'm doing that training now. I've got a four part training program um, in place. It's going to end up being much more than that. But for now, I've got the four parts. And then in the movement perspective, I've just been offering what I call movement specific programs where I'm just working with trainers and, and people who uh, physical therapists just to get them to see the deep. So my eye, you know, as you know, Lise, my eye has like, like I got the eye and it's from looking at it. Yeah. It's, it's from looking at movement and, and looking for those little nuances. Mm -hmm. Where is there tension? Where is there not? Where should there be tension? And there's not, and, and really developing that. And that's what, you know, I hope to train movement professionals is to be able to have that kind of eye to see what, what's really happening in that body that you're working with. Mm -hmm. yeah, to have that yeah. sense for movement analyzing like it doesn't matter like what the sport yes. is it's just uh, it's movement and you have to be able yes. to yes or or the life like you know we all sit 
you know, we all get up from a chair. Yeah, it is. It's movement analysis. And then also taking that data and then do with it because you can have all the data you want, but if you don't have an application, then afterwards, you know, it's not really helpful. So, yeah. Roxy Ballet was founded in 1995 by Mark and Melissa Roxy to deliver artistic and cultural excellence by bringing high quality performances to patrons as an all-inclusive organization, fostering a creative environment of growth for artists of all levels and to preserve and advance the fine art of dance for generations to come. Roxy Ballet fulfills our mission by creating, producing, and performing choreography, formally teaching dance through our affiliated school, and providing highly acclaimed arts education in schools and social service settings. Roxy Ballet is building bridges through dance through its commitment to customizing programs to the specific needs, capacities, audiences, and desired outcomes of our engagements. We thank you for your patronage. No, I think the, the, you know, the biggest thing I would like to impart on you guys is that although repetition is a big part of what you do, it's so important to take the, the things that you repeat all the time and make them new. And because it's, it's just, um, it will bring dance into a, a bigger thing for you. You will understand it better and, and your brain will appreciate it, you know? And, and I think that's how aging is going to be, ben like it's gonna be beneficial for aging, you know, right. in your body and in your mind, yeah. Um, could you give an example of like how we can make something like a plie or a tondu, like something new, since that's something that we do like all the time and yeah don't put much thought into it. Right. So for example, a plie is a perfect example. You're going down, right? So what is going down? Is your spine going down? Are your knees going down? What part of your body is going down when you go down, right? You're going down in space. What is that the only direction you're going when you go in a plie? You're going also wide, right? So you're feeling directional. Knees, Legs are going wide, body is going down. What is there any part of you that's going up while you're going down, right? I mean, maybe, yeah, maybe your core is going up, but identifying where in my body is going down and where my body is going up while I'm going down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So just asking yourself a question to just give yourself further analysis of something you already know and have done a million times just to think about it a little differently. When you right. come back up, are you lifting your body up or are you pressing the floor away? Which one are you doing, mm. right? Like yeah. maybe you're doing 50-50, maybe you're doing 80%, 20%. Mm. What, it, what happens in your body if you did, you know, 80% push the floor away and only 20% lift the body up? Yeah, so the it's, are it's coming back just a, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, right. But like, you know, how does that affect your plie? Does it make it harder, easier? Does it make you think differently about it? So mm -hmm. it's, it's really just an exploration. You have to think of all movement as a giant exploration. And what else can I know about them? What is my relationship with the floor? What is my relationship with my arm? Can I see my arm in my space? Is my arm part of me? Does it feel like my arm is in a circle or does it feel like my arm is just sticking out of my body? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Is my arm connected to my other arm? Can I keep that awareness of the two arms feeling a connection or do I break the two arms and not feel them connected? You know what I mean? And are they connected in the front of me or are they connected in the back of me? You know, there's really no correct answer because it's really just you um, exploring the nuances of your movement. But dancing is natural. I mean, we dancers, you know, we come, we come out as soon as we're upright, we're dancing. And, you know, it's just that, um, you know, in ballet in particular and, and in other dance forms, you want the dancer to do it a certain way. But, you know, it, it doesn't mean they can't do it. It just means that, you know, you have to hone their understanding to give them more 
information so that they can do it the way you want them to do it. So they can dance in the core. <laughs> yes. You know, like everybody else. Your knowledge is just like, every time I see one of her videos on Facebook, I'm like, yes. <laughs> I'm like watching it. I'm like, yes. <laughs> and I always learn something and I'm always like, she's right. She's absolutely right. So um, awesome. I'm so glad that you got to share your knowledge with the dancers and with the ballet. And Thank you. Hopefully Thank people you. Will yes. get with you and yeah. help you out as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Please, everyone, go check out uh, Kaylee's uh, Smart Core Method website and Facebook. Like I said earlier, I will link uh, them down below. And thank you, Kaylee. Thank you, Christina and Liz, for being here. And we will see you all in our next episode next Friday. Okay? Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.